Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. I had the pleasure of meeting today's guests at Rancho La Puerta. If you haven't been to Rancho La Puerta, please put it on your bucket list. Go at least once. It is heaven on earth. I, I can't say enough wonderful things about it. It's I think I'm going to be doing a whole week from there in May, hopefully, fingers crossed, even interviewing the founder, Deborah Seke, who's going to be turning 100 this year. But I always meet the most interesting speakers that I might not have met otherwise. And on one of my trips there last year, I met Andrew Mellon, and he has been called the most organized man in America. And I met him and I went to his lectures and he's just so personable and engaging and funny. But the stuff he teaches is life changing. I actually bought his book on Audible while I was at Rancho, listened to it. My husband listened to it. And we have made such enormous changes and strides in our life when it comes to decluttering. You know, I teach weight loss and, you know, nobody wants excess weight. But when you get rid of excess stuff, it's like that same feeling of joy and abundance. And he's so passionate about it. And he's, he makes, he makes decluttering fun. Please welcome Andrew to the show. I think you're, I just think you're amazing. Thanks, Chef AJ. I think you're pretty remarkable as well. Thanks for that lovely intro. It's great to be with everybody. And, um, uh, and yes, I'm just going to second the notion that Rancho La Puerta is really a magical place. If you can get there, uh, go because it will um, it will transform your your relationship to the natural environment and any sort of a resorty spa y place that you've ever been to or you've ever imagined going. This is like it's the best of the best without it being stuffy or weird. It's just the, the community, the people who work there. It's delicious from the food to the people to the mountain. It's all amazing. Absolutely. So I know you've got a presentation planned for us, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions, but you, you have a theater background, right? I do. Yeah. For the, my, my first career was working in the theater uh, as a, I began as an actor, and then I uh, rather quickly transitioned into a director. And then I also was uh, fortunate enough to run several theaters. So I, w I became the artistic director. So I got to make um, all, all of the art choices about the shows that we would produce. I, I've written several plays. I've, you know, I've produced plays that I didn't write. I've had plays that I've written, produced that I, <laughs> that I didn't, and also didn't direct. And yeah, it's been a, it was a, it was a 20 year career as a professional theater artist. So how did you get into being a professional organizer, you if know. you will? Uh, so th that story is, as I was, um, as I was transitioning from uh, from being an art administrator, I got a gig. I got laid off from a theater in Seattle, Washington, and came back east uh, to the New York area and got a gig co-producing an award ceremony at the Kennedy Center. One of our awardees was a Nobel Peace Prize winner. And so I came to his office to get some photographs that I was gonna to use to put together a slide presentation when he came to get his award. And in the process of going through his files, which were a mess, uh, trying to find the photographs that I was looking for, he and his wife said, hey, would you like to organize our photographs for us? So this is a man that I have admired for most of my adult life. I mean, he's, he was an amazing humanitarian, as I said, a Nobel Peace Prize winner. And uh, I, I mean, I started to cry and said, of course, that would be a tremendous honor. I would love to organize your photographs for you. So we made a date for after the award ceremony was over when I was moving back to New York to, um, to start organizing their photographs. The day before I was supposed to go to work, they called up and said, something has happened. We need to reschedule. Let's do it in a month. And so we picked a date in January. January. January came around, same thing happened, rescheduled for February. February came around, rescheduled for March. In March, they called me up and said, when we're ready to proceed, we'll get back in touch with you. So I never went to work for him. But in those four months, I told every living person I met, oh my God, I have this amazing gig. I'm going to create a comprehensive photographic archive for a Nobel Peace Prize winner. That led to me being referred to a friend of mine who, uh, who is an accountant, and uh, I built a filing system for her. She worked with performing artists all over the world. And in the olden days, she need, you needed paper files. And she also, anytime any performing artist, any artist uh, anywhere, 
earns revenue in a jurisdiction and you're there for more than four weeks, you have to file a non-resident return in that jurisdiction. So, I mean, many performing artists who would do touring theater shows would need to file returns in Montana and California. It didn't matter where they were, where their home was, they would need to have these rather complicated tax returns. And so she needed a filing system so she could find those papers Anytime she was meeting a new client, she would easily be able to put her hands on stuff. So I built her that filing system, blew her mind, and she started referring all of these performing artists, clients to hers, and all of her clients. And people would show up on my doorstep literally with a duffel bag full of receipts saying, I haven't filed my taxes in five years. I've got letters in here from the IRS. I am freaked out. I do not want to go to jail. Can you make sense out of this paperwork before everything blows up in my face? So I would take all of their paperwork. I'd process it. I'd categorize it. I'd put it in QuickBooks. I'd give it to the accountant. The accountant would file their taxes, and these people would say, oh my god, you are a lifesaver. You changed my life. You're amazing. And they would tell all their friends, you'll never believe what this guy did. I gave him a pile of garbage. He turned it around. I am so happy. He's amazing. And is this guy I need somebody just like that how do I get a hold of him and that was how my my second career as a professional organizer began nothing I ever thought I would be doing I mean I thought I was going to be making plays for the rest of my life wow do, are you, do you enjoy what you're doing now <laughs> yeah yeah this is like I, it became very clear to me very quickly that the only difference between what I'm doing now, I mean, I'm not you know, telling stories in a dark room for two hours anymore, but the, the desire to help people and to prompt some sort of an epiphany for folks so that they could live their best life was why I was doing theater in the first place. And now the only difference is that we've removed that metaphor. So there's no connecting the dots. You don't have to try to guess at the story I'm telling you, it's a very straightforward story. And I love the immediacy of it. It feels like the best combination of all of the improvisational work that I used to do in the theater. So it's completely immediate, right? I mean, I use all of those same skills to engage people and um, help break down things that might be complex or confusing or, or overwhelming and make it super simple, easy to digest and easy to then adopt and change your behavior so that you get the results that you want. And what I think is so great about your work, Andrew, is not everybody's going to be able to hire you, but you teach people how to do this themselves. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all about, uh, you know, give me a fish, teach me to fish. And I'm all about teaching to fish. And so we'll, I'm happy to tell folks about um, a little later on the, the next, we're doing a de-stress your mess challenge, which we do these two or three times a year. And we're doing our next one. Uh, it starts on January the 17th. And we typically get about 10,000 people enrolled in that. And we take them through a five day uh, challenge. We cover five of the major clutter hotspots. You know, we talk about papers and filing. We talk about your mindset. We talk about sentimental objects, kitchens, clothes, and closets. And we talk about the three things that people are always doing to undermine their own ability to get and stay organized. And they're always, people are always surprised what they are because they think that they know like, oh, I know what I'm doing wrong. And it's, it's always like, oh, uh, it's a big aha for folks when they actually discover those three secrets. Right. And, and maybe you could speak a little bit about why this is important, because one of the regulars on Chef AJ Live, he comes on every month, is a, is a renowned psychologist named Dr. Doug Lyle. And he's always said that when you have clutter, it creates like cognitive overwhelm or like you. That's why people procrastinate. That's why people can't start their diet or there's something that's just people don't realize the impact of being a clutter bug. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's there's always that. Like people point to Einstein and his historically messy desk, and and they like to throw around that trope that says, uh, you know, if a if a um, if a cluttered desk is a sign of a busy mind, what is an empty, you know, what is a clean desk a, a sign of? And it's I, I think it's such baloney because if you have sensory overload, you can't concentrate. If you're constantly trying to navigate your way through clutter and disorganization, you're, you're burning up 
valuable energy, bandwidth, mind, mind space, while you're trying to stay focused, you've got all these other things vying for your attention. That's one of the consequences of disorganization. But the other one is the whole time management piece that if you're constantly running around the house looking for your keys or your mobile phone or your wallet, if you can't find the things that you're looking for when you need them, you're always running around a day late and a dollar short. And that, you're off balance when you start when when you roll out of bed in the morning if you're already feeling disorganized and overwhelmed how can you possibly be performing at your at peak performance at your best if you're hobbled from the word go yeah absolutely i i, I know you prepared a, a, sh a little presentation for us would yeah, you sure. like to share it yeah of course i would yeah 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 so let's just jump in. I mean, the name of my book, as uh, Chef AJ pointed out, is called Unstuff Your Life. It's a Wall Street Journal uh, and <laughs> number one Audible bestseller. So I'm, I'm really proud of that. Uh, it was published by Penguin, now Penguin Random House. Uh, and uh, it's what I love about it is it's a, it's a really straightforward how-to book. Uh, it doesn't describe organization and leave you to try to figure out how to make it happen. It literally takes you step by step and guides you through it. Not unlike what we're going to do now in a little micro, a micro lesson. And so the first thing I'm going to ask everybody to do is just take three deep breaths. And this is, I mean, you know me, uh, AJ, and, um, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm not a particularly woo-woo kind of guy. I, I really, I, I like math. I like things pretty linear and straightforward. So this is not a particularly woo-woo exercise. What you need to know about the three deep breaths is that you can literally reset your central nervous system with as few as three deep breaths. So this has a real grounding in mind and brain science and body regulation. If you're having one of those days where you think, the day's racing away from you, you feel out of control, you don't have to do anything dramatic to reboot literally yourself. You can just sit still. It will take less than 30 seconds and three deep breaths and you will reset your central nervous system. So we'll do it together. I like to breathe in on a count of five, hold for one, and then exhale on a count of five. It's not a contest. If, you, uh, if you're having a little breath challenge and five, <laughs> a count of five is too intense for you, three will be fine. But the, the goal is to get it so that you can really settle into your breath. So if you'd like to shake it out a little bit, that always helps. And then here we go. Beautiful thing is it works every time. You're having a, a little brain fog, you're feeling a little overwhelmed, three deep breaths, put you right back in your body, right in the center of yourself. It's awesome. Now I'm gonna give you just 15 seconds to think about an intention. What would you like to take away from this time with, uh, with Chef AJ and I? What can I help you with? When, when you think about clutter, disorganization, you've got me here, I'm live, I'm available to you, so what can I help you with? The more specific you can be, the more likely it is I'll be able to answer your question and give you what you need so that you can set yourself free and get started on this path. So just 15 seconds on the clock and uh, hold the intention. You can put it in the chat window if there's a chat window, uh, and if not, you can just scribble it on a post-it or just imagine it for yourself. And the beautiful thing about this is, is that often one of our 200 lies, and we'll talk about this in just a moment, but uh, one of our 200 lies is I don't have enough time to get started. And look, if 15 seconds can start to make you a little antsy, and a little agitated, like, come on, Andrew, I don't want to set my intention. Let's just get to the meat. Let's, let's get to the heart of what it is that you want to share with me. So if 15 seconds can get you agitated, imagine what you could actually get done in as few as one or two minutes, let alone five or 15 minutes set on your, on your uh, timer once a day. You'd be amazed at what you can get done. The next thing I'm gonna do is just show you that I have an agenda for today, for this presentation. I don't have an agenda for the conversation. I'm, I'm here to talk to, to Chef AJ and to all of you, but, and, 
I have a zero tolerance for meetings without agendas. I will not go to them. I, they're not a meeting. I, I don't know what they are, but they're definitely not a meeting. And so I'm just showing you that I'm walking my talk. I have an agenda for how this little presentation is going to go. This is what it is. So you can sit back and relax. I'm a safe driver, not my first rodeo. These are some <laughs> costs of disorganization because, as I said, this is not a woo-woo subject. Uh, disorganization has real math-based consequences in our lives. And so I just want to go over a couple of them with you so that you can really ground yourself in the math and you can hold on to that. If you start to get a little overwhelmed, if you get a little short of breath, if you start to have some feelings about some of the stuff we're talking about, you can just return to the math and it's a good place to ground yourself. So the first statistic I'm going to share with you is that the average person uh, has 80% of the stuff around them, and particularly in your office. If we think about papers, uh, digital files that are on your computer, 80% of that stuff you will never touch again. And now this is what, in my world, we talk a lot about story. Story meaning the, the narrative explanation or excuse that you tell yourself uh, for why clutter exists and why you are exceptional. So this is the first place that story might be cropping up for you and it, it, you know, it just typically runs back here in your little lizard brain. You might be thinking, oh, Andrew, you don't know me. Uh, I'm the exception to your rule. 80% of the stuff that I'm holding onto will definitely come in handy someday. Not sure when, but someday this stuff is, this is priceless, important information, and it will definitely come in handy. This is what I want you to know. I've been doing this work for over 25 years. I've worked all over the world. I have uh, worked uh, with, you know, heads of state, and I've also worked with uh, stay-at-home parents. I've worked with all different kinds of people, over a half a million people so far in my professional career. I've yet to meet the exception to this rule. So you might be quite exceptional in any number of ways. I feel super confident in saying that when it comes to the statistic, you are my rule. You are not the exception. The next thing I want to share with you is that the average adult will, t will tell 200 lies a day. Now, uh, I'm not calling you a liar. <laughs> I'm just saying that probably 200 times in the day, you will tell a fib to yourself. Chances are two thirds of them will never even leave your mouth. They'll just be things that you tell yourself. And they may or may not be happening on the conscious or the subconscious level. But you will, um, a, a third of them might actually come out of your mouth. They might be as innocuous as, hey, AJ, I'm so sorry to bother you. But the truth is, if I was sorry to bother AJ, I wouldn't be bothering her, right? In those moments, what I want trumps anything that I could be thinking about Chef AJ. So just start to pay attention to this. This isn't a gotcha exercise, but you'll start to recognize how these things come out of your mouth or they just swirl around in your brain, and you'll start to recognize, oh, that's one of my 200 lies. And they're all often, when we think about it as it relates to clutter and disorganization, they're typically excuses or explanations for why you can't do something or why you have to do something. Chances are either of them are not necessarily aligned with your core values and they are further complicating your life, not simplifying your life. The last statistic I'm gonna share with you is that the average person will waste one year of their life looking for lost or misplaced items. Now, to be clear, nobody, regardless of how frugal you might be, will spend a year of your life looking for your mobile phone, right, or your car keys or your wallet. Uh, I call this nickel and diming ourselves out of a year of our life because it's five minutes here, it's 10 minutes there. We'll tell ourselves one of our 200 lies, oh, I'm gonna make up that lost time. But this is the reality about the time is that you can't make up time once it's been spent. You can bank money, you can't bank time. So you just have to be super clear that you can tell yourself, it's just five minutes, I'll make it up. But the reality is, over your lifespan, that will add up to a year or more wasted that you will never be able to get back. So let's, uh, let's draw that line in the sand. Whatever you did before we met, it's done. It's over, you've spent the time wisely, unwisely. From this moment forward, let's bring our attention to the choices we're making so this doesn't keep happening. Now. Clutter is nothing more than deferred decisions. The first thing you set down wasn't even necessarily clutter. It was just a thing that you set down, probably with one of your 200 lies. I'll get back to this later. And then you put something else on top of it, and you probably told yourself another one of your 200 lies. You know what? These two things go to the same place. So this is good time management. I'm going to make a little stack of all of the things that are related to each other. 
I don't have time to deal with it now, but later I will definitely deal with it and I'll put all of them away. That's where clutter comes from. Good news, bad news, you could let most of it go because 80% of it you're never gonna touch again, but this is how powerful story says. Story, you know, story starts to run and it says, God, I would love to just let it all go, but what if there's something super important in that pile? So this is what I want you to think about. If it's the deed to your home, if it's the title to your car, if it's your living will, if it's your great-grandmother's antique engagement ring, go find it. If it's a recipe for lemongrass creme brulee that you ripped out of a Martha Stewart living seven years ago thinking this would be a great dessert for a, a dinner party that you've never thrown, that could easily go in the recycle bin and nobody is going to, nobody's quality of life is gonna be negatively impacted because of that. And in 30 seconds, you could find 14 versions of that recipe online. So really, you just have to be super clear about what your time is worth and how likely it is that something waiting in that pile is gonna be worth your investment. Now, as you start to go into that pile, you do need to remember that it will get bigger before it gets better. So those piles, those bags, those totes, whatever it is that you've been shoving stuff into, the corners of, your, of that sad, scary corner in your basement, whatever it is, as you start to break it apart and put it in its like-with-like -like piles, it will seem to get bigger, but it isn't any bigger. It's the exact same number of items, but it will just feel bigger. So I want you to know, forewarned is forearmed. So I just want you to remember, as it looks like it's morphing, it's the exact same quantity of things, so you don't have to freak out about it. We already have this conversation. Now let's talk about your mindset, first of all. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I don't have a calendar with a someday on it, and neither do you. If you are scheduling things for someday, you might as well say that you're scheduling them for never, because that's how likely it is to happen if you don't actually make a discreet appointment with yourself and put it on your calendar. We value what we choose. So where you put your attention is basically what you are manifesting. If you want to be disorganized, uh, and if you want to be organized, and you want to simplify your life, you just need to put your attention there. But if you are putting your attention other places with one of your 200 lies saying, oh, I will do this later, what you're actually doing is what must be the most important thing to you. And if you're doing it unconsciously, if you're not actually bringing your attention and your awareness to it, let's turn that around so that you are being more deliberate and intentional about every moment that you're awake and alive. That's the way to affect the kind of change that you, I believe you want if you want to simplify your life, if you want to declutter your life, if you want to lose weight, if you want to change your eating habits. It, it's all about intentionality and awareness. Now, to that end, value is not guaranteed. So if you're sitting on a bunch of stuff and you're thinking, I will definitely let this go as soon as I can sell it or uh, you know, cash it in or somehow harvest some money for it, you just need to remember that um, for something to have true value, two people have to agree about its monetary value, right? Specifically, you as the person who has it and the other person who's willing to give you what you think it's worth. If you're, if you're unclear about what something is worth and you're going to just hold out for some monetary, some undefined monetary value, be super clear that what you then have is just a bunch of Beanie Babies or Yadros or Hummels or silver. You have something and you've got a story, but until you can find that second person who agrees with you, that's all you have. Now, if you want a simple life, you just have to make simple choices. It isn't more complicated than that. Sometimes it, it feels a little more intense or overwhelming, but the reality is the marketplace tells us this makes our life simpler and easier. It's a clamshell. The clamshell has triple wash lettuce in it. It's organic. The clamshell is supposedly um, uh, compostable. So it seems on the surface like this is the smarter strategic choice. But the reality is, Inside these clamshells, I found sand, so I still have to wash this lettuce, and my browns and greens in my backyard will not melt this. It doesn't get hot enough to compost this plastic at home. This has to go to an industrial compost pile. So the promise is easy, convenient, but the reality is I still have to wash the lettuce, and now I have a piece of plastic I have to rinse out, put in the recycle bin, and wheel out to the curb. So promise versus the reality. Whereas if 
I just buy a head of lettuce at the green grocer. I know exactly what I'm getting. I know I have to wash it, and this will compost in my backyard. So we just need to be super smart about the choices that we're making because the marketplace will tell us this is a shortcut. This will make your life more comfortable or more convenient. It will make things easier for you. But will it really, or is it actually complicating your life? Every day we have hundreds if not thousands of little decisions that we make and we're either simplifying our life or we're complicating it. And if we will slow down just a little bit to think it all the way through, it becomes much easier to decide which is the right choice for us in the long term, not just the short term. Now, as I said, when I think about story, I often think about this old TV show. I don't know if you're old enough to remember the TV show Dragnet, but there was a character named Joe Friday on it, and he would show up on people's doorsteps and he would say, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. So that's what we're trying to do here, is we're trying to channel our inner Joe Friday. And if that's not a, a TV reference that resonates with you, here's Luther. I don't care which <laughs> detective you choose to channel. What we're trying to focus on is just the facts, not the story. The story's not gonna help us, but the facts will. Now, this is the organizational triangle, and these are the only three, three, three rules you need to know to get and stay organized. The first two rules are how we get organized. The third rule is how we stay organized. And the organizational triangle goes like this. One home for everything, like with like, and something in, something out. We'll do that one more time. One home for everything, like with like, and something in, something out. Now. One home for everything means everything has one home and only one home. Where Chef AJ keeps her keys can be different from where I keep my keys or different from where you keep your keys, but your keys have a home, her keys have a home, my keys have a home. They can only ever be one of two places, in our hand unlocking something or in their home. You follow this rule, you'll, you'll be able to find anything in 30 seconds or less guaranteed. Like with like means all like objects live together, not just most of them. So instead of keeping most of the tools in the toolbox in the garage, but keeping the Phillips head screwdriver in the junk drawer in your kitchen, because you've always got a story about like, you know, the knobs are always a little loose. I don't want to go all the way out to the garage to get that screwdriver. This is good time management. The problem is you typically go out to the toolbox to find the screwdriver. You don't find it there. You might even end up at the hardware store picking up a new one and then Three weeks later, you're digging around in the junk, junk drawer through, you know, you find the old Ikea hardware that's in there, the bread twist ties, and there is that Phillips head screwdriver. And the first thought you have is probably not, oh, I, this was clever of me. The first thought is probably, who's the bozo that put this screwdriver in here instead of putting it in the garage? The second thought was probably, oh, that was my great idea. The third one is probably one of your 200 lies. Oh, now that I've had this little moment, I will never forget that this is what I've done, and I promise you in 30 seconds, you will have forgotten it, and you'll be on that gerbil wheel over and over and over again. One home for everything and like with like, you apply those two rules, you will get organized. The third leg of the triangle, something in, something out, is just how we stay organized. So, and what that means is once you achieve stuff equilibrium, once everything has a home, you are organized and now all you're doing is swapping out things that you're replacing. Because look, if you've ever said there aren't enough hours in the day, why would you spend any of them accumulating things that you do not need because you already have enough stuff instead of spending that time on the things that actually matter to you? When it comes to getting and staying organized, these are your new best friends. Timer, stopwatch. Timer is so that we can move away from narrative goals. Instead of saying, I'm gonna work on this until I'm finished, I'm gonna suggest that you now say, I'm gonna work on this for 15 minutes, or 30 minutes, or an hour. The quantity of time doesn't really matter. What matters is that instead of setting yourself up for failure, because you're saying, I'm gonna work on this until I'm finished, but you might not finish, and we don't really know what finished is until finished arrives often. So it is much better to just work in incremental math-based quantities because when the timer goes off 15 minutes you actually did what you said you were going to do your word and your deed are in sync failure breeds failure success breeds success so if you've set the timer and the timer goes off you actually did what that was the goal you achieved the goal the, the stopwatch is just so you can time all of the things that you have a story about maybe one of your 200 lies like it takes me 15 minutes to get dressed in the morning it takes me 45 minutes to do a load of wash it takes me an hour to go grocery shopping 
instead of having that be a guesstimate, because we tend to under or overestimate when we guesstimate, you would be much better off timing yourself for one week, just one week, as a little noble experiment. It's not a gotcha exercise. Time yourself and just see how long the things that you do on a regular basis, how long they actually take you. How long does it really take you to take a shower in the morning, to brush your teeth, to put on your makeup if you wear makeup, to get dressed, to make a cup of coffee if you make coffee. How long does it take you to make a meal? How long does it take you to commute to work? All of those things, let's get the real math behind them. A few last, uh, uh, last uh, points I want to share with you. Your dad is not the clock. When it comes to sentimental objects, your dad is not the clock. Your grandmother is not the teacup. If you are endowing inanimate objects with the responsibility of keeping, in particular, deceased people alive for you, you're doing a tremendous disservice to yourself and, unfortunately, also the memory of the person. Because what happens if that teacup that is so evocative of grandma gets broken? Do you run the risk of losing all of the memories of grandma? No, of course not. But you've made, you've actually abdicated your own personal responsibility for keeping the memories of grandma alive and made the teacup responsible for that. It would be much better off for you to keep those memories alive in ways that become palpable and, uh, and communic communicable, that you can share them with other people rather than relying on a, an, an inanimate object to keep your sentiment and your memories alive. No gift is a burden. Uh, it's just pure and simple. If you are holding on to things because you are feeling guilty, I am now granting you permission to let go of everything that you are holding on to only because you feel guilty about it. And remember that it is the sandwich that is special, not the bag that it came in. And the last thing that I'll share with you is that when everything is precious, nothing is precious. So I was helping a client, a private client, clean out her grandmother's house on Long Island in New York. We came across two silver objects in that house. One was a ball of aluminum foil under the kitchen sink because grandma had lived through the Great Depression. And the other was a sterling silver tea set. Now, had we stopped just there, right? If we would have allowed ourselves to be vague and sketchy, two silver objects, both belong to grandma, grandma's gone. These are the last things that are left in the house, right? If we were not being specific, we could keep them both. But of course, they don't have equal value. The ball of aluminum foil, as important as it was to grandma to keep saving the aluminum foil, she never used the aluminum foil. It was just in case something cat catastrophic happened, like another Great Depression, but she never used the aluminum foil. Uh, she would use clean aluminum foil and then put the used aluminum foil on the ball of aluminum foil. So huh? that went into the recycle bin. The sterling silver tea set was sold at auction for $22,000. So clearly there's a difference between trash and treasure, and we just need to sit still long enough to recognize it. And with that, that I, I'm super excited to, to support you in anything else that we can talk about around decluttering your life. And, and again, as I mentioned before, we do have this De-Stress Your Mess challenge coming up uh, starting on January 17th, so I'm happy to answer any questions about that or anything else that's on your mind. Thanks, Jeff. Oh, Andrew, this was wonderful. So to get in the challenge, they just go to your website and sign up? Yep, yep. I will tell everybody so that there's no surprise or gotcha. We do charge $1 for the challenge. We used to make it free, but we found out that by you actually putting $1 down, I mean, obviously it's worth more than a dollar, but by you putting a dollar down, it actually gives you some skin in the game. You're more likely to show up. Everybody is inundated, particularly now at the beginning of the year with all of these challenges and free offers. And it's e super easy to opt in and then it's super easy to not show up. And I want to make sure that if you are going to, if you, if it, if it's important to you to participate in a five-day de-stress your mess challenge, that you actually have the motivation and the accountability to show up. So I'm asking everybody to uh, just contribute a dollar, and for that dollar, it literally triples the pr the likelihood that you will show up. So I'm all about the results. Great, thank you. Uh, people are really enjoying the talk and are thanking you very much. And one of the common threads I see in this from people like Jerry and Romita, and you, you did touch on it, but how do you get rid of sentimental items, mementos? That seems to be hard for people. Sure, well, so 
let's be clear. Let's, first of all, let's address the mindset, right? If you are framing it as this is going to be hard for me or this is hard for me, it will be hard for you because you've just, you've just created a construct in which it is difficult as opposed to I will have feelings about this process is different, right? There is, you're not predicting an outcome. You're just acknowledging I have attachment to things and I will have feelings as I'm sifting through these objects without any outcome predicted from that uh, acknowledgement. So I would say let's start with the mindset first and let's dismantle some of the it's going to be hard, it's going to hurt, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be difficult, any of those uh, charges around the process. And then let's look at the objects. Uh, what's the end game for the object is a place that I always encourage people to, to start. So if we're looking at old family photos, do you have kids? Uh, are your kids digital natives? If they're digital natives, I feel pretty confident that they are not going to be sitting in a window seat in 50 years with a cup of tea flipping through old photo albums, right? They live in a technological world. So they're going to want those images digi digitized and they're going to want like digital frames or other ways to interact with those photos, probably not photo albums. So what we want to think about is the end game. If, if you're the last person to touch this object, what's going to happen to it when you leave? And if you have heirs, if there's people who are here going to be here after you, what are they going to do with it? Because if you think it all the way through, it becomes easier to make the decisions about where it's going to go. Does it belong? Is it museum quality? Do we want to donate it to a museum? Or is it just anecdotally informative to you because of your memories attached to it? But really, if anybody else came across it, it would have zero meaning to them. And it's likely to end up in the garbage or in the recycle bin. So you want to be able to dispassionately, not coldly or clinically, but dispassionately be able to dismantle where the story starts, where the story ends, and what it is that you're, you're hoping to achieve by either deacquisitioning the item or by holding on to it and where it's going to end up ultimately. Hopefully that helps. No, I appreciate that perspective because I remember three years ago when I moved from LA to the Palm Springs area, I wanted to get rid of stuff. It were things that had value, but not sentimental value. Like I had some wedding gifts that were, that cost, you know, several hundred dollars, Tiffany vases, uh, sterling silver candlesticks. And I tried to sell them and the people were saying, kids today don't want antiques. They don't want old stuff. They either want no, no stuff or like you say, and I always think about it, like, who's going to want this stuff when I die? I don't even want it now, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, so I mean and just about uh, just more about that value thing, right? I mean it's so it it can get um tough for people when they are stuck on that money piece, right? Like these are beautiful Tiffany candlesticks. I, we ought to be able to get some money for them, but if there's no secondary market for them, it's just it's it's it is exactly what it is. And you can stay stuck in the story and the insistent expectation that somehow you're going to be able to harvest something from it. But the reality is there is no market for it. Right. But sometimes like you just don't want to take it to Goodwill either. In that case, I just put them by my bathtub and actually I'm enjoying looking at them. But sure. yeah. So Susanna, who's watching live, says, how do you organize a home with nine people living there? She actually has nine children. I guess only two have left. So she's in a home of nine. Well, again, I would start with the organizational triangle and I would go room by room and figure out where I would group like with like because you can't find the right home for anything until all like objects are together. So I would pull in your kitchen. I would pull all of the cooking utensils together and start to see, do we have enough spatulas? Do we have too many spatulas? Uh, do we have enough mixing bowls? Do we have too many mixing bowls? Do we have enough plates? All of those things, as you group them together, often disorganization is amplified when things are squirreled away in what we perceive to be an open or available space, but they aren't grouped like with like. So you could be eating up a lot of space in your storage in your cl closets, in your cupboards, because you've got some mugs here, some mugs there. You've got some canned goods here, some packaged goods there. You've got some dishes here, some dishes there. As you bring like with like together, you, first of all, then you'll be able to drill down and decide if you want to let any of the 
things go. And then as you reassign them a home, you'll be able to put them all together in a space that's large enough to contain them all. And I would just encourage you to go room by room. And you know, without sounding overly self-serving, I would say you could probably sign up for our challenge because I think that you would make tremendous headway in those five days. Um, in jumpstarting this process for you. And then you could even get some of your kids on board if they're game, right? If they're not game, it's gonna be about you. But if you, can, if you can convince any of them that this could be a little gamified experience in the home, you'd be amazed at what could happen in those five days. Well, I, I remember taking it once when it was free. So I'm certainly willing to pay a dollar and take it again because it was really wonderful. And I hope everyone will put the links. I hope everyone will sign up. I will definitely do that again. Uh, you know, Colleen is saying she's organizing as she's watching, which is great. And Jerry made a fun comment that you teach people to unstuff their life. I teach them how to unstuff their face. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could actually do something together with that. I thought that was very clever. Yeah. So here, here's a comment that I'm seeing uh, that people are saying, some of them are saying that they're very organized, but they live with a clutter bug. That's kind of my situation. What do you do if you're in a mixed marriage? Yeah, so... Um you're in the marriage and unless you want to get out of the marriage there's a certain amount of you know who you married and you have to if you are holding on to the expectation that somehow they are going to change you're going to make yourself crazy and you're going to make them crazy and it's really going to negatively impact your relationship i will say again without sounding overly self-serving i did teach a class on this on stuff discordant relationships so um there's a 90 minute class that's available at Unstuff University at my website. If you're interested in checking that out, I mean, the short answer is really uh, stop trying to change your partner. They, if you can't get them to agree that the clutter creates a common problem for everybody in the house, it is only a problem for you. And if you want to be happy more than you want to be right, you will let go of some of your need for organization. And, and, I, and I want to be clear that I am not being uh, either flip or cavalier when I say, you know who you married, right? If you're not dating them, if you've actually lived with them for any length of time and you've been in a relationship with them, it, this cannot be news to you. And, and just like, I mean, if they don't like uh, Brussels sprouts, at some point you're, you're gonna stop cooking Brussels sprouts, expecting them to like, to eat them and go, I don't know why I didn't like these for the last 20 years. These are amazing, <laughs> right? They don't like Brussels sprouts, leave them alone. Make Brussels sprouts for you, but leave them alone. So they funny. want a carrot, make them a carrot, stop. That's so funny. I keep trying to get my husband to like Brussels sprouts because I <laughs> love them and he won't. Yeah, make them for yourself and celebrate the fact that you love them. Just stop making them and saying, well, just taste one, honey. He's tasted one. He does not like them. It's the same thing if he doesn't or she doesn't see that there is a problem with the disorganization. If you can't find a common problem, you can't find a common solution. You have the problem, so you need the solution that works for you. Ooh, I love that. I wrote, I'm going to write that down. If you can't find a common problem, you can't find a common solution. That pertains to what I'm doing with people. That's amazing. Yes. So Andrew, in my work, I find that anybody can lose weight. Most people have many times, but where the rubber meets the road is most people unfortunately can't maintain their weight loss. Do you find in your line of work that most people can to some degree get organized, but the difficulty really comes with staying organized? Well, I think that they are not the same thing. They are certainly related, right? And it is, there are parallels between your work and my work in that, that many people have gotten organized over and over again, but staying organized, that's where the 200 lies and the mindset comes into play. Because the, the, as soon as there's a hiccup or a bump in the road, people tend to stop maintaining their structure, right? They're putting their keys back in their home, putting their mobile phone in their home, hanging their bag up when they come into the house, putting their, hanging up their coat if they're living someplace where they, you know, where they wear coats, putting their shoes away. All of these things are just daily maintenance things. But if you let them stockpile, if you don't put the dishes in the dishwasher or wash them by hand, then you have a backlog of dishes in the sink and it becomes that much harder to get motivated to go and address them. If you deal with them in the moment, there is no residual 
emotional, psychological, or time-based expense to dealing with it. But that's, that's a mindset issue. And so the answer is yes, I see it. I also see that people, um, perhaps because stuff is external, uh, I do see that there is far greater retention. Once people lo learn the organizational triangle, there is far greater retention and it is much easier for them to get back on the wagon, as it were. Um, it, it doesn't feel as all or nothing as I think it sometimes does around food, right? And also food it, it comes with so much baggage around uh, possibly family of origin and, um, you know, a, a, an expression of love. And then, you know, you feel like you're depriving yourself of something if you're not indulging in things. And it just, it, so much story is bound up in it. Right. So people are saying that they like to get organized, but then their kids undo it. Yeah, well, it really depends on how old the kids are because I've taught four-year-olds the organizational triangle. This is something I'll tell you. If you have small kids, no lids. Small kids, no lids. If you want to live in an L day core home, you got to give that up until those kids move out. If you are, if you have like a toy chest and you've got a lid on it, or you've got little totes or tubs, and you think that that's where they're going to put their toys or their art supplies, you're setting yourself up for failure. If they have to move something out of the way to put something away, they are not going to do it. If you give them an open bin and say, this is where the stuffed animals live. This is where you put your art supplies. This is where the Legos go. This is where your doll goes and all of its clothes, they can easily hit that mark. And that, again, can be very easily gamified. You can set a timer for 15 minutes and you can say, you know, uh, whoever does the most gets a, you know, gets a, a, a sliced apple and some peanut butter, you know, and they get the, you know, they get the first pick of the snack or whatever it is. You can easily gamify it and set a timer for 15 minutes and your kids will run around the house like crazy people putting stuff away. If it's easy for them to do and you tie it into some sort of a gamification or a win for them. If you've got teenagers or people who do not want to adhere to the system, that there's, you've got a bigger issue, which is about your parenting style and how you are communicating. And, and again, if you're sharing space with people that have a certain degree of awareness, right? Like not toddlers, not small kids, but teenagers, tweens, teenagers, young adults, um, you can easily say, we're going to, now this is different than a partner, right? This is a partner is your peer. Your kids are not your peers. So if you say these are going to become the new rules of the house and I'm not going to foist them on you, but we're going to develop them collaboratively, again, common problem, common solution, we're going to develop these solutions collaboratively. So I feel like there's too much clutter in the common areas and we can't easily leave the house on time for our appointments. So I want us to find a home where we're gonna put all of the keys for everybody in the house. I wanna find a place where we're gonna create a charging station for everybody's technology. I wanna find a place where all of your incoming homework and your assignments and things that require my attention go. We're gonna create a command center. And if you will do that collaboratively with them so that they have some buy-in, rather than just you're passing down the law, like I've decided this is where things live, get with the program. If you let them have a stake in where things go, they have a, then a stake in keeping those systems in place beyond your edict that they must comply with. There's just such a parallel between our work. I can't tell you, this is like mind blowing. It's the same thing. Like if you, you have to enroll the family in healthy eating, you can't just expect that you're going to go on a, a program and then have everybody else eat crap around you. This is, this is brilliant. A lot of people are saying how helpful this is and that people like Gail have started the decluttering or finished the decluttering process and how freeing it is. I don't, it, it's sort of like, like, like <laughs> Hey, I got one of those too. Wait, hold on. I think a lot of times with people until they've, you know, reversed their disease and lost weight and realized how, they didn't realize how bad they felt until they felt better. And it's sure. the same thing with decluttering. Like my husband is finally starting to get on board and I don't think he even realized it until the, the, the mess started to go away. It's just, it's the feeling. It's, it's just, it's, so, it feels so good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, once you, once you start to get a taste of, of, 
space around you and you can think clearer and you don't have so much psychic as well as physical s stuff pressing in on you, once you experience that sense of freedom and liberation, most people want more of it. And it feeds on itself. As I said, failure breeds failure, success breeds success. Once you get a taste of, oh, this is what it's like to have my kitchen counters clear. I want the, the vanity clear in the bathroom. I want my nightstands clear. I don't want all this crap. I don't want to go to sleep with all this crap piled up around me. It's just, it's, it's beautiful when you see the light bulb go on for folks. And because it, it is the kind of thing that, it does build momentum and it builds geometrically. It's not a straight math equation. So once you crack open the code and you start to make some progress, it becomes easier and easier and the results get bigger and bigger. Right. I think it'll help people lose weight. I really do because it's oh, like totally. when you have, like, especially when your refrigerator is organized so that when you open it, instead of seeing a bunch of crap, you see clear glass containers with chopped up fruits and vegetables. I think I think our worlds really do intersect. So this is, totally. this is wonderful. Well, and also in the closet, right? I mean, as you're losing weight and you're, and you're, if you're, I mean, beyond gastric bypass or something, you know, that kind of bariatric surgery, right? You're not going to lose a hundred pounds in three weeks. And you're also not going to gain 50 pounds in a week. You're not going to wake up fat. So this idea of like holding on to the moo moo just in case, right? I mean, if as you're dropping sizes, you can let those things go. If you need to go get a pair of fat jeans, you go buy one pair of fat jeans. You don't need to keep nine pairs of them. Right. Carla says, five of my kids left home. They left all their keepsakes behind. They won't take them, but won't let me get rid of them. What do I do? That's not fair. They, they have to take them or let her get rid of them. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, Carla, look, you have a couple of choices. If you're feeling really generous, you can go rent a storage space for each of them and put their things in it, pay the rent for six months and give them the key and say, in six months time, you need to figure out what you're going to do with this stuff. Because I've paid the rent for the first six months. You can either keep paying the rent for it and you can keep your stuff not in your home, but you can hold on to it, but it's going to cost you some money or, you know, they're going to reclaim it and the stuff is going to end up on storage wars. That's the generous way to do it. The other thing that you can do is say, look, I'm going to give you three months or six months to figure out what you're going to do and it's going to stay in the house. Uh, but after that, if it if it doesn't find its way to your home, it's going to go to the you know thrift store, the secondhand store. I'm going to put it up on next store uh, or you know Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, and it's going to leave. Yeah, you if they're grown adults who are living independently, th you are not required to hold on to that stuff. And I'll share a, a super quick story. I was doing a presentation in Portland, Oregon. There was a woman in the audience there, had a storage space in New Orleans. She's in Portland, Oregon, storage space in New Orleans for her daughter's stuff who's living permanently and has been there for 20 years in Amsterdam, Netherlands. I, when, she, when we had this conversation in that presentation, she started to cry. She, full of story about like why this was impossible. And I just held her feet to the, lovingly held her feet to the fire and said, this is preposterous. I can't believe that you're doing this. Uh, my recommendation is you, you'd be better off flying your daughter here from Amsterdam, going through the storage space and getting rid of it in the next month. And that's exactly what she did. She met her daughter in New Orleans. They spent a weekend going through the storage space. What the daughter wanted, she shipped to Amsterdam for her. And by the time they left New Orleans, that locker was gone, given back to the storage space. And she had set herself free from that monthly bill month in, month out for 10 years. It's crazy. Wow. Well, I think if you have a storage space, that's God's way of telling you you have too much stuff. Yeah, or that you have too much money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Uh, Lakeisha's saying, could you talk a little bit about the challenge? I've been posting the link for people to just straight up register. Um, so she says, are there exercises or something like that? So the way that the challenge works is we meet every night from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern uh, on Zoom. Uh, and uh, each night we deal with a different clutter hotspot. Hot spot. So the first night we deal with mindset, fundamentals, and papers. The second night, I believe, is kitchens. The third night is clothes and closets, or those might be reversed. Uh, the fourth night is sentimental objects. And the fifth night is the three secrets that are keeping you stuck. So we address 
each of those the, every night. There is homework that's assigned. We have a private Facebook group that we create for each challenge where people post their before and after pictures. You can ask questions about the challenge. Uh, you can ask questions of me. You can ask questions of the community. And, um, and you get a workbook. So the, the homework is in the workbook. It's not, uh, it's not hours of homework. You can do the homework in between 15 and 30 minutes a night and feel successful. If you have more time, you can do more than those 15 to 30 minutes. But we make it so that it's relatively low hanging fruit and people can, can win stack, as we say, so that you have easily achievable uh, goals for each day. And as I said, we cover all those different topics every night. So the homework is specific to those topics each night. And I actually took it during one of my trips at Rancho, which wasn't easy because, you know, you can't always get on Wi-Fi. And I found it really fun and enjoyable. And I'm encouraging people to sign up by putting the link in the chat and the show note. And I want to thank Susanna for the super chat donation. And Tiffany Wilkerson, who's actually not only watching live, but is my guest tomorrow. She's going to do a fabulous uh, cooking demonstration, says, I can see the two of you teaming up together. A wonderful combination of needs. So that let's think about that because yeah, I already, I'm more, already, I already adore you. You know, uh, AJ, a different AJ who's watching live says, well, you know, that my initials are AJ. Well, then it's meant to be. That's yeah, meant Andrew to be. J. That's my middle name is J. Shared. So uh, AJ, a different one watching live says help with paper clutter and filing. Yep. So, um, big topic, uh, not a, you know, we don't have hours <laughs> to, to, to drill down into it, but what I would say is, um, when it comes to papers and filing, you again want to group like with like, and you want to get super clear on the end game for the papers as well. What can be digitized? Because at this point, even your tax returns are digital, right? I mean, you can file your tax returns online. You can have all of the supporting materials digitized. The IRS will accept it. So you have to ask yourself, what are you holding on to? Uh, and is it do you have paper from uh, previous properties that you no longer own? Uh, have, do you have anything from estates that have been settled? Are you just holding on to old utility bills, credit card bills? So we need a little more specificity because paper in and of itself is a bugaboo for everybody, almost everybody. And we, we need a little more granularity to be able to problem solve for you specifically. But I would say the first thing to do is group like with like and get super clear on what it is that you need to keep. Is it related to a home, uh, a home based business, uh, uh, an actual, you know, brick and mortar business? Is it uh, things that you no longer own, owner's manuals, things like that? Because those can easily go right into the recycle bin. Right. And there's a question, help with arts and crafts, supplies. Is there a best way to store it, best practices? Well, again, I would say group like with like, and then beyond that, <clears throat> uh, one of our 200 lies around being a creative person, it might be that uh, the creative mind is seldom organized, baloney. Uh, beyond that, also, are you more in the business of accumulating supplies or actually using them? Because sometimes the folks that I end up working with are people who like to buy art supplies. And even if you're, even if you're picking up found objects to make assemblage, you're still accumulating things, but not necessarily budgeting time to be in your studio creating. So at one of the forks in the road, I would say, are you making art or are you just making supplies, accumulating supplies to make art someday. We want you to be making the art so that you're actually using the supplies. And then when we think about the supplies, I would group like with like, again, acrylic paints with acrylic paints, oil paints with oil paints, uh, you know, uh, dried flowers with dried flowers, magazines with magazines. If you're using those, you know, if you're clip, clipping art out of magazines or, you know, paper things, I would just group like with like and, um, and then start to figure out how you're going to go through using them yarn with yarn. Make sense? Absolutely. What I always teach people, the environment is critical to their success with weight loss, having a clean environment. And this is just another example of having a clean environment. Totally, totally. 
Yep. Yeah. Have you ever, Andrew, encountered a person that is completely organized? So you walk into their house and, it, you know, it's pristine, but they just have too much stuff. How do you help that person that, that is organized, but has just too much stuff? Well, is it too much stuff because the house doesn't function or is it too much stuff because you or I might think it's too much stuff? Well, I think looks, you would think it's too much stuff. Well, but I, who cares what I think? I mean, if, if the home functions, look, I'm not a big knickknack guy, but if you have a, you know, if you have a bunch of glass shelves on your living room wall with a bunch of tchotchkes on it and they're, you, you can easily clean them and you can access them and you know where all of them are. I don't care, it's your home, it's not my home. My home looks like my home, your home can look like your home. So if you know where everything is, if like is with like, if you, if you never lose time looking for something because you know where it is, then it isn't too much stuff, it's just a lot of stuff. But I, I would only say that it's too much stuff if it's starting to interfere with your functionality inside the home. I bet you would be a great therapist, you know? <laughs> I really, I mean, it's just yeah. amazing. And uh, so there's a couple of questions about, uh, from like from Deborah, if, if somebody misses one of the sessions of the de-stress the mess session, would they be able to watch it afterwards? Why, yes, you would. <laughs> because we record all of them and they're all available on the replay page. So yes, uh, you, you don't, I mean, we like you to be there live, but of course p life happens. So yes, every session is recorded and it's uploaded to the replay page. And I think within like an hour uh, after the broadcast finishes, it's posted and available online and then it's there 24 seven. Well, this is perfect and it's the perfect time of year for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. January 17th. I mean, that's that's usually when people have already given up all their New Year's resolutions. Exactly, so. right, exactly. It's a great, wow, you are just terrific. I could just, I, and I love your podcast. You, you you didn't even mention you have a wonderful podcast. Oh, yeah, we do. Uh, we actually, we achieved, uh, you know, Apple gave us, uh, iTunes gave us a new and noteworthy. We, we I mean, we had a, a tremendous launch for uh, my podcast called Declutter Your Life. And um, so, yes, I mean, if you like these little bon mots, it's, uh, I try to keep the episodes under like 15 minutes because really, I mean, the, I have a nice speaking voice, but really, the point is to give you something to work with and then to set you on your way. I don't really need to be talking for hours. So um, I, I'm really pleased with the podcast itself. I love it. I mean, it, I, I know you. if people really wanted to work with you privately, they could, right? Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I still have a few private clients. And so if you want to f continue this conversation, of course, you can send an email to hello at andrewmellon.com. Just Remember that my last name is spelled M-E-L-L-E-N. Uh, so send an email to hello at andrewmellon.com and we can talk about any sort of private client work or, you know, if there's, I do a ton of speaking and corporate training. Primarily, some of it is around organization, but a lot of it is around time management. Uh, I'm working on my third book, which is called Calling BS on Busy. And uh, so I do a lot of work around time management and productivity in the corporate space. If, anybody's looking for some help with their teams to get them a little more productive and focused. When does that book come out? That's an excellent question, AJ. I'm still working. I'm still working on it. So. Well, I know it's just because I want to have you on the show to talk about it. I just want to yeah. make sure because I love that. It will definitely be out before the end of 2022. I mean, that's I'm committed to it, it coming out in 2022. So yeah. a lot of people say they don't have enough time, but I've always one thing I've noticed about life is that time is the only commodity that's actually fair. In other words, we all have different amount of good looks or health, or, uh, money, but we all have the same 24 hours, hours a day, yeah. 24 hours a day, 168 hours a week. Yep. Uh, so that's, I mean, with all the love in my heart, that is definitely somebody's 200 lives in very few cases. Uh, do we not really have enough time for the things that matter to us if we're willing to prioritize them? Often we, we do that thing where we, um, we are penny wise and pound foolish, where we spend our time on little inconsequential tasks that give us a little hit of dopamine. They help us feel good in the moment. We get to check something off a list, but really if that thing had never been done or if it had been delegated to somebody else, whether that's a kid or a task rabbit or an assistant or somebody, 
the, the quality of your life would not have been negatively impacted by you specifically not doing it. So we have to be very judicial, judicious about um, what we're prioritizing and, and what we're doing, what we're, how we're spending our, our very precious 24 hours in the day. Uh, there are circumstances, of course, you know, single parents working two jobs, uh, kid, if you, if parents with kids with special needs, partners that are, you know, have special needs at this point, you know, either because of uh, an illness or a stroke or something like that. There are circumstances where time is, your time is committed because of your important relationships with other people, time is committed other places and you are not in complete control of it. But for many people, it's just about where you're putting your attention and what you're prioritizing and making sure that you're prioritizing the things that actually matter rather than just checking crap off your list that doesn't move the needle forward but makes you feel good in the moment but in the long run doesn't have any be actual benefit. Yeah. Uh, Kathy says, do you recommend storage bins and that type of thing to put stuff in? Remember, no kid, no lid or something like that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> or kid, um, kid, no lid. Yeah, uh, if you've got kids, no lids. Um, so uh, I don't have a problem with plastic storage containers. What I want to stress is make sure that you get all your like items together and decide which ones are staying and going before you try to containerize things. Otherwise, you're going to buy the wrong size container because you're either going to buy one too big or not big enough. So much better to do the work of deciding what stays and what goes and then containerize it once you're clear that these are, these are the amount of USB cables and ethernet cables and charging devices that I need to have so I can get a small little plastic tote rather than a big plastic tote and just throw random electronic devices in it, right? As opposed to the camera equipment goes with the camera equipment, cables go with cables, uh, mice and uh, track pads go with mice and track pads hard drives go with hard drives. It becomes much easier to organize and containerize when you have the correct quantity understood and you understand the, the volume of it, meaning how much space it takes up. Well, you know, one of the things I'm seeing in the chat is a lot of people, they've had parents that were hoarders and just after their parents died, it's just been a nightmare trying to declutter their, their stuff. That's why you got to do it. So you don't put that on your kids, guys. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely not something that you want to be the legacy that you leave behind. And it is, it's, a, it's a definite sadness when folks have to walk through that. Um, and uh, you're not obligated to keep anything, right? I mean, if they've got an older toaster than you do, first of all, are you eating toast? Second of all, if it's an older toaster, somebody needs a toaster, but you don't need to keep it just because it was mom and dad's toaster. If you like it, you can swap your toaster for that toaster, but you're not obligated to keep it. Just because they didn't make the decision doesn't mean that you need to inherit the lack of decision you, in addition to the toaster. You got the toaster. You don't need the, the indecision to come with it. it doesn't, it's not a package deal necessarily. Yeah, there were so many comments about you. People just say they love that you're both no nonsense and compassionate at the same time. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, it's I, it's important stuff that we're doing. It's real life, uh, and we're just people trying to connect the dots. So there's no point in it being um, aggressive or mean spirited, punitive. We're not we're not trying to accomplish something at any cost. We're trying to have a, a, improve the quality of our life and move ourselves forward. So treating ourselves and certainly anybody that we're supporting and helping with a, a, a large dose of compassion and kindness and generosity just makes it much easier for everybody else. And even when we're dealing with sentimental objects, we're dealing with inanimate objects. We're not talking about companion animals. We're not talking about our children, our parents, our partners, you know, our, our siblings. We're talking about inanimate objects. They don't have feelings. So if there can't be some sense of levity and some lightness to this, right? I mean, it could, it could turn into something that just feels very ponderous and overwhelming. So some playfulness certainly uh, 
uh, like Mary Poppins says, you know, makes the medicine go down. Nice. That's what Dr. McDougall says too. So there is a question if you could work on Zoom with somebody in another country. Oh, I do it all the time. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I've got, a, I've got a private client right now. She's in Japan. So uh, we typically meet uh, my morning, her evening. Uh, yep. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've got clients all over the world. Great. Well, here, here's a poignant question I just saw. I have severe health challenges and energy levels. Can you give me some hope to this being possible? Couldn't somebody hire somebody? Maybe not you to come, but there are people that can help. Sure. Yes. And first of all, of course, I can give you hope. Look, I've dealt with, I've got, I've, I've got students of mine, clients of mine, traumatic brain injury, um, you know, lupus, uh, uh, cancer, all, all kinds of diabetes, all kinds of uh, diseases, conditions uh, where there is limited mobility, limited uh, energy. You, you can, you'd be amazed at what you can get done in 15 minutes a day if you actually set the timer for 15 minutes a day and do it. And as AJ points out, right, there are certainly, depending on where you live and what your finances are, right, there's TaskRabbit, there are, there's NAPO, the National Association of Professional Organizers. You can find a professional organizer. You can, um, maybe you've got a friend or a family member who would be willing to volunteer, right? Maybe there's a, a, a tit for tat exchange that you can do where there's something that you can do to support them and they come and spend 15 minutes. 15 minutes of their time and 15 minutes of your time is not straight math. It's geometric. It's there's a factor of two plus anytime uh, more than one set of hands is doing something. So there's plenty of opportunity. And yes, of course, uh, there's no reason to be despondent. I, I even if you know the circumstances are dire, you've got a tremendous amount of stuff. I have seen people dig themselves out of things that uh, that previously had them stuck and feeling overwhelmed. If you're willing, if you, even if you're willing to be willing, you can make headway. Yes, guaranteed. That's amazing. Well, you are very fun and inspirational and I'm going to take the challenge. I took it, but I think there's always something to learn and there's always something to improve. Yes. You help me with my golf balls. Do you remember? I had a private. I do. Session. I do. And and so I, I it's great. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to tell the story here. It's kind of funny. I, I'm not really a pack rat, but I, you know, when I see, I, I live on a golf course and there's golf balls and some of them are actually very pretty. You let me keep a few of them because actually what I'd use them for is sometimes when my back hurts, I'll sit on a golf ball. So you yep. let me keep, I actually let me pick, I think a few, cause I keep one in the car, one in the bedroom and one here, but I pick the, the prettiest ones, but we're always finding golf balls. And it was just like these little treasures. And I just kept collecting them. Now here's the thing. I don't play golf. And I don't think I'm ever going to play golf, but I couldn't let them go. And I had these huge containers of golf balls in my garage. And I could think, well, maybe I'll learn an art and craft job or make poodles out of it. And you told me they had to go. But I found a neighbor that actually wants them. And so I still get to the fun of collecting them, like finding the Easter eggs. And then I just give them to Paul. It's Perfect. great. Yeah. It's Perfect. great. Yeah, you're the best. Thank you so much, Andrew. I wish you every health and happiness in the coming year. And hopefully we will get a chance to work together and have people unstuff their lives and faces at the same time. Oh, it'd be, it'd be a delight. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'll look forward to seeing you in the challenge and everybody else who, who uh, shows up. And yeah, let's figure out more ways to unstuff our lives and unstuff our faces. I think it's awesome. You're right. I think we'll get a lot of people. I'm signing up, guys. A dollar. Come on. I'm, I'm definitely going to be there. Thank you so much for everyone for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we're going to Let's do a little bit of organization because Chef Tiffany Wilkerson, who's a PCRM cooking instructor, is going to show us how to make mason jars of food. And that's a very organizational way to eat food, isn't it, Andrew, to have yes. it kind of in jars like that? One home for everything, like with like. Yeah, you're the best. Thanks so much, everyone. See you tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.